Deuteronomy chapter number 28 to get you all up to speed. We're going to summarize a lot of the chapter for you. <clears throat> uh, beginning verse number one, the Bible recounts where God tells his people okay, that if they did all the commandments that God commanded unto them, that the following things would happen. The first one, he said that he would make them chief among all the nations of the world. Right? There'd be nobody that would be as magnificent or as enriched, as blessed as the people of Israel. Then he goes on, he makes a ton of promises to them, all the way down through verse number 15. Okay? But, verse number 14, that's where we're going to start reading. It says, And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I have commanded thee this day to the right hand or to the left, or to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all the curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Okay, now, if you will, skip down with me, verse number 27. Okay, between verse number 15 and verse number 27, there's a whole lot of curses and vexations that God says that he will do to them. But verse number 27, it says, The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. Now, we've already summed up the gist of the chapter, but I mean, it keeps going. Deuteronomy chapter number 28, long chapter. It's got 68 verses, okay? But the chapter deals with those that are willing to be obedient and their reward, and those that choose to be disobedient, and the correction and the consequences for that disobedience, okay? Now, the Bible says that obedience is greater than sacrifice, Right? People think that sacrifice is always what God wants. No, God wants people that are obedient. Sacrifice is to make up for something that was done wrong. If you do it right all along, that's better than having to make up for it. Right? Does not the Bible say that the great commandment, Jesus answered when a lawyer asked him one time, what's the great commandment? He said, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's the first commandment, if you will, the greatest the one that takes precedent over all others. Right, go study the Ten Commandments, just the first ten. There's a whole lot in there that takes care of itself if you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the rest falls in place. Right, we talked two weeks ago about how when we give God the proper place in our life and we submit ourselves, right, things tend to fall in line. Right, if you submit to God on the direction of your life, you're not going to be hanging around people that would tend to draw you away or steer you away from that place. Why? Because they don't hang out where God wants you to be. Amen. That doesn't make sense. Okay, but, verse number 15, I mean, he just gave them 14 verses of promises of blessings. He said, all you got to do, obey the commandments that I already gave you. He's saying, I'm not giving you anything new. Right? That's why our pastor says, if it's true, it's not new, and if it's new, it's not true. God's standard's always been the same since the beginning. It was holiness. It was righteousness. And the law, as the Apostle Paul wrote to us, was given to us as our schoolmaster to show us that we were not perfect and we needed a Savior. But God's rules and standards have always been the same. You can dress it up however you want to and say, well, Jesus over here technically gave a new commandment. No, it falls in line with all the old ones. He was the Word made flesh. Amen. He may have phrased it a different way, but it's still the same root. But, by this point, Deuteronomy chapter number 28, there had been some that had already proven that you could live by faith. In this day and age, uh, they had examples before them. God's not asking them to do something that they think is impossible. They know it's possible. They know that faith can take them places that they never dreamed of. Right? These are the people that were taken out across the Red Sea. 
where God held Pharaoh and his armies behind them with a wall of fire so that they could cross over safely. Right? These are the people that ate manna, quail, came from heaven. These are the ones that saw water come out of a rock. Not just a little bit of water, but water to water all the millions of people and all of the livestock that they took with them out of Egypt. There was a river that came out of that rock that day. Right? These are the people that when there was nothing but bitter or salty water all around, God made a way to make the water sweet. Now, these people, without a doubt, should have had no question about submitting unto God. But yet, God gives them the alternative promise. He says, I'm not going to make you serve me. He says, I'm not going to chain you up like the Egyptians had you chained and put you in bondage and had evil taskmasters that would work them to the bone and sometimes to the death. And he said, I will not do that. You have a choice. And he says, but if you make the wrong choice, look at verse number 15 again. He said, I command thee this day that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Curses are things that you cannot escape. When someone is cursed by God, only God can undo the curse. A curse is something that you are marked with. You know why God sent the plagues of Egypt? They were curses to the people of Egypt. You know how long they lasted? Just as long as God said they would. You know how many of Pharaoh's magicians and sorcerers and everything else that he could conjure up tried to undo all the things that God did? Notice, go back, study it all. It said that they could imitate or reproduce an effect, but they could never undo what God did. They did what they undid what they did. That's easy to understand. If you know the trick, it's easy to undo it. But see, they were trying to imitate the things of God with tricks. And when Pharaoh said, see, they can do the same thing, they could never undo what God did. Right? It's very clear that when God does it, nobody can undo it. That's one of the beautiful things about your salvation. If you're saved, God did the work, only God can undo it, and he promised that he won't. Right, he said that your hand's in his hand, his hand's in the Father's hand, no man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. You are twice sealed by the hand of God in your salvation. There's no way for it to be undone. Well, the same is true for God's curses. You know what caused the water in Egypt to turn from blood back into water? God undid it after a certain time period. Pharaoh and his men... They had no effect on it. It was on God's timetable. It was a curse under the, all the land. The last plague, right? The one that resulted in the feast of the Passover becoming a tradition for all the years of the Israelites. Even to this day, they still celebrate Passover. But that last plague, the plague where the firstborn of every house and the said of every animal would die when the death angel passed over. Right? We know that story. You know why that death angel didn't take the second, third, fourth, fifth? It's the angel of death. You know what it does? It causes death. You know what stayed death that night? The word of God. Amen. God placed a curse upon the firstborns of any house that didn't have the blood of the lamb stricken upon the doorpost. But you know what stopped it from being everybody that night? It was the power of God. But a curse cannot be shaken. It cannot be altered. It cannot be improved. It's something you stuck with. Think of it, if you will, as a brand. Right? Once it's in, it's a part of you. Right? It has changed who you are, and it changes how people view you. Okay? God says, I'm going to make an example out of you and a lasting example. He says, you're not going to be able to undo it. Okay, but then he also says, the curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee, in verse number 15. 
Right? It's one thing if somebody were to curse you with being shot with a squirt gun. That it's annoying. People do it to cats all the time when they act up, right? Or dogs. Spray them with water. Right? But that's not gonna derail my day. I can still go on throughout my day even if somebody keeps shooting me with a squirt gun. I'm gonna be a little soggy, but that's not gonna overtake me. Also, eventually that sucker's gonna mess up and he's gonna stand in front of my car when I'm getting in it, and then he's gonna be flat. No more squirt gun. Okay? It says it'll overtake them. You know what that means? It's going to take precedence in their life. It's going to afflict them so much that it's all they can do not to think about it. It's ever present. It is life altering. It's stronger than they are. And it says, and it will overtake them. But, if you will, there's a bunch of different things that the Lord talks about. I got down to verse number 27. Okay, it says, First, that the Lord will smite them with the botch of Egypt. Okay, nowadays they call the botch botulism. You know what botulism means? Botulism is a disease that causes your skin to be eaten away. Some people back in the day called it leprosy. Okay, but once you get it, there's no hope for you. Go study your Bible. How many times do you find leper colonies? They would exile people out of town so that they couldn't infect the rest of them, and they were left out there to die. They would bring them food and necessities and things to take pity upon them, but they never got the best of the best. Right? They wouldn't give the finest silks and raiment to people that had leprosy because once it touched them it could never be worn by anybody that didn't have leprosy once somebody grabbed that basket that had leprosy nobody else would touch it because they were afraid of being contaminated the first thing that God curses them with yes would be the botch but really what he's saying is he's cursing them to be ever on the outside Amen. he says if you reject me if you become disobedient, the first thing I'm going to do is force everybody that you think is more important than God to desert you. They're not going to want anything to do with you. That's the symbology behind it. Now, make no mistake, there were people that were disobedient that God gave them the botch. But it comes from, where does it say? Egypt. Does the botch of Egypt. You know what Egypt is always a picture of in your Bible? The world. I don't find where people get the botch when they're hanging around the things of God. But if you're disobedient, you know where you're going to end up? A place in the world where you can get infected with the botch. Now what's it affect? It affects your flesh. You do realize that if the flesh had its way, it would eat itself alive. It would tear you piece from piece all to devour right, its desires. It'd sell its own self out for one more moment of pleasure. You think it's any wonder that when people fall into sin, that they start selling things off that used to be important to them or valuable to them? That they start forsaking the people that used to mean the most to them? That eventually they'll get down to the point where they know that to do the very thing that they desire to do, it's going to shave time off of their life. And yet they choose to do it anyway. That's the spiritual version of the botch. They're consuming their very selves. Just to have one more moment where they think that they called the shots and that they're enjoying themselves. Right, well, look next to verse number 27. It says, And with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. Now first he talks about the bots, came from Egypt. He says, then, he talks about the emeralds. Okay, then it says the scab, itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. All of these have no cure. Now there may be something that you can do to mask it for a while, to tolerate it, but it is progressive. If it cannot be healed, 
You know what that means? It's only going to get worse. I've never found anything that we would consider an ailment that if you leave it alone, it's going to stay just the way that it is. Even if it doesn't change, the way that your body reacts to it is going to change. Anybody ever had an ingrown hair? Nothing changed about the hair. It's still hair. Right? What changed? The way that your body reacted to that hair. God may afflict you with something that at first seems minor until it runs its due course. It may not change. It may be something simple. Everybody, anybody ever had an itch you can't scratch? At first it's minor. Until what? Until it drives you insane. It's just an itch. It ain't going to kill you. In fact, if you get busy enough, your mind will eventually get distracted from the itch. But if it keeps itching, it's going to get your attention. But it says that you cannot be healed. Literally an itch that will never go away. That, that sounds like torture. That, that sounds the same way that... Anybody ever heard of the Chinese water torture? Where you know that eventually it's going to drip, drip, drip. Well, they say that people that have been subjected to that, you take them out of that situation, even though there's no harm that's come to them physically. It says that for days they can feel like there's still something hitting them in the forehead. That's not something that you can change. Right? That, that's a physical and mental reaction to what you've already been through. That, that's what that itch is. It's not going to kill you. But it's going to be unbearable. You say, oh, well, itches aren't that bad. Try having one for about a day and then come back. Report back to all of us. Let me know how bad the itch was. Okay, but it says the scab. We're going backwards. A scab is something that's trying to heal. But if it's got a scab, it didn't heal. Anybody ever, if you were like Christian and Jordan, right, you do something stupid on a bike or on a scooter or on, eh, could just be playing darts in the front yard and Christian puts his hand up in front of the dartboard right as I'm throwing it, right? <laughs> he ended up with a dart in the arm and he learned his lesson. When somebody's throwing darts, don't put your hand in the way, okay? That's exactly what happened. Needless to say, no more darts after that day. He ruined it for all of us. Because okay. he couldn't keep his mouth shut. But anyway. It wasn't that bad. Barely went in. But, get a scab. Fall down, skin your knee. The scab shows that it's trying to heal. But the fact that there's a scab there means that it didn't heal. You ever have a scab and then you go to do something like you do normally and the scab reopens? It says here that this scab is never going to be removed. Y'all ever skin a knee and then every step you take for like the next four weeks you're opening that scab up over and over and over again? Right? Or you get a cut in the webbing between one of your fingers and every time you go to grab something it opens up again? That's what this is talking about. It's something that will heal over where it's not going to get worse but as long as you keep re-injuring it it's not going to get any better in fact if a scab is reopened long enough it will actually start getting the scab will become bigger in size eventually to the point that it will immobilize whatever it is that it's scabbed over right if you get a for instance cut right here in between two bones on your finger. If you keep opening that and letting the scab keep her in, that scab's going to start eventually expanding to where you won't be able to bend your finger anymore. The first one, what's it do? The itch. Well, the botulism and disease of the flesh. The itch, what's it do? It's there to drive you nuts. It's to steal your peace. This one is to steal your mobility. Eventually, a scab is going to get to the point that if it ever heals, all you are is a giant scab. The more you reopen it, 
Every time you reopen it, you're losing a little bit more of something that used to be there. Because when a scab is torn, you know what it takes with it? Healthy flesh. That's what it was attached to. And when it takes the healthy skin away, guess what it gets replaced with? Another scab. And eventually all you're left with is scabs. Be awful. Right? I cannot imagine, even in the case of Job, this was just boils. It wasn't even scabs. But I imagine they scabbed over afterward. When Job sat in the ashes, took that piece of pot shirt and started scraping those boils off of his skin, can you imagine the day after when they scabbed over? It said that he was afflicted from head to toe. You know what that tells me? His entire body was a scab. I imagine Job didn't do much moving on that day. But if you've ever had a scab, you try to walk different. You try to handle things different. You try to do things to make accommodation for it. But the thing is, it's always there. All it takes is a momentary lapse and all of a sudden, scab got opened again. Well, it says also, the emeralds. Emeralds, old-timey word for something nowadays that people would call hemorrhoids. Okay, that's what, it's, what it is in the Bible. Go study it out. Okay, but emeralds, literally, right, are a pain in the butt. Okay? I don't think that's crass to say that. Okay? But there are several times throughout the Bible that God strikes a population or a people with emeralds. And in other accounts, you're going to find that it didn't matter if they're standing, if they're laying down, or if they were sitting down, they could find no relief from the emerald. They didn't have Preparation H back in the day, all right? They didn't have lidocaine cream back in the day. Things that could numb the sensations of the flesh to where you could ignore it or block it out. I'm sure they had things of... Like I'm sure if you go take this bark and chew on it for a while, you might forget a little bit of the pain. But here it says, remember, these are curses that are what? Overtake them. It's not something that you can get away from by drinking this elixir or taking this tonic, right? Or rubbing this on it. It says, well, overtake them. And the emeralds are a sign of what? that they have no rest. They can't sit, they can't stand, they can't sleep. Doesn't matter where they go, they're always in constant pain. Doesn't matter how they try to find relief, relief cannot come. And if you're in pain, guess what you're not going to find? Rest. You may fall asleep, but you didn't rest. When you go to sleep in pain and you wake up in pain, there's very little rest that happens. Now, you can, trust me on that one. You can take that to the bank. It's eventually why I caved after 10 years of having herniated disc and back problems and finally had surgery because I couldn't take the pain anymore. I made it a while, but I couldn't take it no more. Why? Because I'd wake up and my left leg would be in pain from hip down to the ankle. Okay, if I turned... Pain would get worse. If I sat down, pain would get worse. If I stood up, pain would get worse. And it was something that was what? Internal. I couldn't readjust. Right? I couldn't scratch it. It was something that I had to deal with. And no matter how much I tried to rearrange it, well, maybe if I just put all my weight on my other, then it'd be worse the next day than it was the day before that. It defied logic. Right? You know what made sense? Let's make the pain go away. But when you're in pain, and all you can think about is the pain, and everything you try to do, from sitting on one of them rubber donuts to hanging yourself upside down by your feet, right? because I've got one of them inversion tables. I used to hang upside down like Batman. Okay, But you can try whatever you want to. Pain's not going away. There's no rest. There's not a time or a space 
where you can unload all of the tension because you're constantly under tension. Right? And in one verse, keep in mind, 68 verses to this chapter. Okay, we just read one verse that was 12 verses after the one that we read before that. And in one verse, do not sign me up for this. Right? God could have stopped there and I'd have been like, I think God's pretty serious about us trying to follow him. But no, if you're curious, read all the curses that he, he's cursing the land to where it won't bear fruit and it won't be beautiful anymore. He's cursing their very children. He said, you're going to have kids and have no pleasure in them. He says, your very children won't be able to rescue you from your misery. I won't let them be a highlight in your life. He says, they're only going to cause you problems. Right? Can you imagine? Right? If little Ella run around here, little Elizabeth... Right? When you see them, instead of everybody just instinctively smiling, being like, yep, there they go jibber-jabbering again. Right? Instead, when you see an innocent child like that, you think, man, that thing makes my life miserable. Now imagine thinking that about your own kids. That's a curse. But see, all of these things God commanded that he would do to them that were disobedient. Okay, we're not going to be talking about disobedience and obedience. But every time that God does something, records something, puts something down in writing that's permanent, you'll find that the devil always tries to imitate it. This is what God does to people. It says that it will overtake them. Well, here's the thing. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I don't care what the devil cooks up. It's not stronger than you are because the person inside of you is stronger than him. You cannot be overtaken when you've got the trump card. You can't be beat when you have the one who said, let there and everything was created. Amen. But the devil uses those crafty methods that we talk about. We're not ignorant of his devices. We know how he does it. But the devil's not above trying to steal a play out of God's playbook. You know what the devil will try to do? The devil's going to try and irritate that flesh of yours. Okay, we've talked a lot lately about how we're supposed to nail the flesh to the cross, take up our cross, and follow after Christ. It's supposed to be immobile. We're supposed to render it powerless. We're supposed to exert authority and control over it. You know what the devil's going to try and do? He's going to walk up to it and poke it with some things that aggravate it. Make it start kicking around. Right? Now, we know that they cannot overtake us like a curse from God. The devil cannot curse you. The devil can't do anything to you without God's permission. And when God does give permission, again, we've already mentioned it, go look back at Job. You know what God did? He said... Here's what you can do, but here's what you can't do. He always set limits on them. He didn't say, here's Job, do whatever you want to. He said, twice, he set limits that the devil could not violate. Same is true still to this day. How can you be overtaken by somebody who has to play by rules that say you cannot be destroyed? In fact, the only place in the New Testament that I find that the devil will destroy someone is when someone's become so disobedient that God turns them over for the destruction of the flesh, that the soul might be saved. You've grieved your own soul and God so much that he allows the flesh to be removed from you. Why? So that you can enter into eternal rest. It's not going to be pleasant at the judgment for you, but there is peace on the other side. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying the devil can't do anything to you that will permanently impact you unless you let it if you ignore it it's going to get worse if you try to handle it on your own the arm of flesh is going to fail you I didn't say that the devil's not stronger than you he's a being of light he was first and foremost among all angels in all creation he was the minister of music in heaven went by the name Lucifer till what? till he rebelled against God and God cast him out Anybody in here today think that they can whoop an angel? Because that's what he used to be. 
Go read the next couple of chapters of your Bible and find out when a cherubim comes down to an enemy encampment and see what he can do in one night. Right? You know who I find might have had a shot? The archangels. It says that they contended with Satan over the body of Moses one time. You only contend with people that can put up a fight. Right? My name's not Michael. My name's not Gabriel. I don't want to take it up. The devil's stronger than I am, but he cannot overtake you. He cannot defeat you. So what do you do in life? Because the Lord allows it. The devil throws something in your life that you feel you just can't shake. That could be an itch. could be a scab. could be, as the Apostle Paul wrote, a thorn in the flesh. Something that was embedded in there and wouldn't come out on its own. What do you do? when you've got that itch that you just can't scratch. Right? Well, the first thing I find, in the Old Testament, when people were afflicted with diseases and illnesses, when it got really bad, you know where they went? They went to this place called Gilead. In Gilead, they had a medicinal ointment, renowned for its potency and its effectiveness. It wasn't a cure-all, but they found that, that it helped out more times than it didn't. In fact, when a sickness one time was ravaging the land, one of the prophets said, is there not still a balm in Gilead? Amen. Have you all forgotten about the things that God's provided us with in the past that can help us now? What's that balm of Gilead? Well, in ointment, guess what it's mostly made of? Right, A lot of times it's some sort of liquid. Okay, that's the device that's used to deliver the medicine. But when it comes to water or liquids, you know the best example that I find in the bottle or the, in the Bible of water that'd be the Word and the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Amen. The Bible talks about the washing of the Word, yes. and it makes reference to how the Holy Ghost also is like under water. Well. If that's the delivery mechanism, what's in that ointment? Well, in that ointment, there's things to soothe. Right? Did not Jesus say, cast all your cares upon him because he careth for you? When you cast your cares upon him, and by faith you trust that he's going to be able to handle what you cannot, there's this thing that you get that's called peace. Peace is different than rest. Peace will allow you to cope with something. We'll get the rest here in a little bit. But peace allows you to move on when previously there was something that was a roadblock. When all you could think about was this thing that was in the way, peace will put it in its proper perspective. A peace that passeth all understanding, you do realize why that is a miracle from God. Because God can make anything that your flesh is terrified of, anything that your flesh thinks is going to cripple it or maim it or end up in its destruction, God can make all of those mountains turn into molehills real quick with some perspective. Amen. And you know what that perspective will give you? Peace. Yes. Perspective is one of the things that comes in that balm when you've got an itch that you just can't scratch. Maybe that itch is going to drive you in a direction to seek help where along the way you pass somebody who's in a worse state. God used that itch to drive you towards what? Somebody that needed help. In that balm of Gilead, you get that perspective. Peace is something that can soothe. It doesn't take it away, but it can make it manageable. God won't ever numb you to something because God himself, when he was robed in the flesh, was what tempted in all points, like we are yet was he without sin. That he was touched with the feeling of our infirmity. God felt every emotion through the person of Christ. The same way that you feel it 
so that he could become your high priest. And the Bible says that he'd be able to succor them that came unto him. You know what that means? Since he knows what it's like, since he knows how it feels, and he overcame it, he can help you bear it to also overcome it. When Christ overcame it, it, didn't, it wasn't like you know, all those things just went away. No, he conquered it in the flesh to prove to you that it was possible. But he contended with everything, every day, the same way that you do, yet he still lived a perfect and sinless life. To become Christ-like means that we allow him to give us the peace, to give us that bit of relief, to take the edge off of it. Why? So that we can focus on what the Father would have us do. That's what he did. That's what's in that balm. That balm of Gilead has things that will help heal. Sometimes you've got an itch because there's something wrong that you can't see. If anybody in here has ever had athlete's foot, thankfully I have not. But if anybody has had athlete's foot, when it starts out, you can't tell it's there. Right? It's an infection. But it starts out, the infection's under the skin. Just itches all the time. Even after it presents... Scratching the top ain't going to help. The problem's down deep in the root. Right? It's under the top layer of skin. That balm of Gilead penetrates. Right? If God wills it, there's nothing that can prevent it. If God wants you to have it, you're going to have it, but that doesn't mean that God wants it to overtake you. In fact, God wants to show you grace and mercy so that you can overcome it and be an example to the world that what you have is different than what they have. Because they get it, and guess what? They're lame. They can't walk around. It becomes gangrenous. They start hacking limbs off. Right? But God's people, man, eh, this is no big deal. It looks pretty serious. I don't feel a thing. Yeah, it itches every now and then but it's nothing I can't handle. That I've learned that itching it only makes it worse in the long run. I just put this ointment on it. But what's that medicine? Right, Those are the spiritual truths and promises of the Bible that keep your soul stronger than your flesh. In truth, medicine is to empower your body's natural protective systems to be stronger than whatever it's infiltrated it or is messing with it it's truly what medicine is it's meant to make you stronger than what's come into you well what do you think the bible's meant to do it's to make the spiritual man stronger than the flesh it's to keep your relationship with god stronger than your relationship with the world Right, we've already talked about perspective will take the edge off. It'll give you peace. But the true medicine is allowing you to maintain that perspective. Allowing you to maintain your position with Christ. Amen. Right, but, it says here, that he would smite them with the botch of Egypt. The devil will try to stir up your flesh to where it starts gnawing on itself. Do not ask me why. I cannot explain it. But there are times that people get into so much pain that they start literally gnashing on their own skin to try and dull the other pain that they're experiencing. If you don't think that's going to happen, read your Bible. It says in a place called hell that there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth Amen. where the worm dieth not. In hell, the flame is so painful, causes so much torment, that they try to consume their own flesh to cause pain to take their mind off of it. This is one problem. You can't escape that pain. Well, you know what the devil tries to do? He tries to cause you so much discomfort in the flesh. And if you go long enough without putting an ointment on it, without putting that balm of Gilead... That flesh is going to get so pain, it's going to start trying to gnash at itself. You know what happens when the flesh starts chewing on itself? 
Most of the time it's tragedy. Most of the time it's somebody who used to be strong in the faith and now you can find them with the blood out. Used to be somebody that was a pillar and now they've crumbled. When the flesh tries to consume itself just to satiate something, let me put it this way. The itch isn't going to go away on its own and you're not smart enough to make the itch go away. That's why God said that in every temptation he would make a way of escape. Because if you were stronger than the itch, you wouldn't need an escape route during temptation. He said there's always a way to get out of it. But if you stay in it long enough, you're going to start tearing yourself apart. You hang around temptation long enough, you're going to give in to it. That's why God said he made a way of escape for you to get away from it. If you pass the test, you don't have to go through it again. But the more times you fail, the more times you're going to have to be encountered with it. You want a recipe for a disaster? Right? Temptation will what? Try to consume you. But temptation can't force you to do anything. You still have to what? Choose to do it. You know what temptation does? Temptation is an excuse machine. It'll feed you all the excuses in the world until you feel okay doing what you know that you're not supposed to do. That's temptation. You know what the answer to temptation is? Truth. Again, what are we coming back to? The Word. The only true truth in this world is what God recorded for man to know. What God has blessed people to understand through the Holy Ghost, because the Bible says that the Word is spiritually discerned. Truth, again, will do what? Put things back in perspective. You hang around something long enough, you become what? Desensitized. When you become desensitized, then you deny the danger. For instance, if I lose my mind, okay, not planning on it but if I lost my mind and took a job at the Cincinnati Zoo in the reptiles that ain't gonna happen okay I'm not as unfond of snakes as dad is but I don't like them okay I wouldn't say I got a phobia but if I see one it's better dead than alive yeah there's a bible for that by the way it says that God put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent you know what I mean I'm supposed to hate it okay because God made me that way. If you don't hate them, you're weird. Okay? And maybe you should sit on the other side of the church from me. I'm kidding. But being around something all the time will get you... Dis if I hang around them long enough, I may think, well, I've never seen it bite anybody. It's never bitten anybody in all this time. I've been around it all this time, and I've never... It's never even looked at me. When you start getting comfortable around things that used to be dangerous in your mind, that's when an accident or a tragedy is getting ready to happen. When you forget about all of the reasons to take precaution, to put on the whole armor of God, when you forget about why in the first place your soul was so hesitant to go, but your flesh craved to go along with it. The flesh loves danger. You don't believe me? There's a whole bunch of daredevils and adrenaline junkies jumping out of planes and bungee jumping off of bridges. Why? Because they're, they love adrenaline. The fear of death is something that they have turned into excitement. That's twisted. I'm not saying I wouldn't go bungee jumping or jump out of an airplane, but I'm so big, I'm going to have to have Andre the Giant behind me, right? And I don't think they make parachutes that big for guys that big, okay? I saw Operation Dumbo drop. I think that was fiction. I don't think they have parachutes that big. Point is, your flesh will think, no, we can make this fun. And there is pleasure in sin for what? A season. To what? You let your guard down. Then you snake bit. You know the most dangerous kind of snake venom? It's called a neurotoxin. That affects your very nerves and your brain. 
It keeps your brain from being able to tell the rest of your body what to do because it stops the nerves from being able to carry those transmissions back and forth. You know what the danger in getting comfortable around something? The danger in temptation? Right, that thing around you that you can never get comfortable around it? Don't become comfortable around things that used to make you uncomfortable. When your soul is throwing up the red flags and the Holy Ghost is saying, hey, danger, danger, don't get used to it. Because if you get used to the itch and used to the pain and you leave it untreated long enough, eventually it's going to start impacting your ability to tell your body what to do. You will become, as they say, a slave to desire. You'll chase impulses. You'll chase emotions or feelings or people all for the hope that they'll make you feel better. Even though you know what's right, communication's been cut off between your soul and your body. Why? Because you got comfortable around it. And one day, when used to, it wouldn't have been a problem. You had that mental lapse. You know what cures all that? Truth. When I know that going over there, right, tramples on the blood of Christ that he shed to save me, that might change where I go. When God gives me the ointment of reassurance, knowing that I'm up underneath his wings, and as long as I'm there, I don't have to worry about any of that. You know how far temptation can come? As far as you let it. Because if you turn tail and run and use that way of escape, I find it can't follow you. God gives you a refuge, a place to rest, to get away from it. Why? So the next time you encounter it, you've got your strength back again. But the devil will try everything that he can to make you in the flesh uncomfortable. You know what the problem with that is? A true Christian doesn't care what happens to the flesh. A true Christian cares about spiritually how healthy they are, how much they're doing for Christ, how much they can serve other people. And a true Christian would say, better to walk into heaven, halt, lame, blind, as we heard last week. Why? Because I'd rather have all of God than all of the flesh. Amen. When the devil tries to stir up something that you can't, who said that you got to scratch it? Right, something that small, it's easy to think, well, I can take care of this until you can't. You ever had something like touch some drywall and then next thing you know, you're getting like a little tiny, itch, or not drywall, insulation behind the drywall. You start getting little scratches and you're like, well, what in the world? You ever scratch something hard enough and long enough that you've made it worse than what the original scratch was because you've just been tearing away at skin? That's what happens when you try to scratch something in the flesh. Amen. You know what you're doing? Causing more damage than you are good. How about instead of that, you ask the Lord in the Spirit to help apply a balm of Gilead, an ointment, something, yeah. that will allow you to bear it to where it's not in the forefront of your mind. Help. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, but you know what God told him? He says, my grace is sufficient for thee, and his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Maybe God allowed you to get the itch from the devil to remind you that you're not all powerful and you're still human. But God didn't want it there to overcome you. He just wanted it there to humble you, to show you how weak you really are. Because after all, how strong are you if you can't take care of a little itch? Some itches go deep. Some itches can't be healed from the top. Sometimes you've got to address the problem on the inside. Some things, if you leave them in your own hands, they're going to start scabbing over. Then eventually it's going to get to the point where the scab spreads. And then you can't sit down, you can't stand up, you can't go for a walk, you can't lay down and find relief from it at all. Where did all that start with? You trying to handle it. How about instead you allow God to teach you whatever the lesson is for why he allowed it to enter your life? Then, 
joyously with peace in your heart go out the door knowing that it's just temporary when it's run its course God will remove it and if it doesn't run its course God will remove it when he gets it to heaven but he promised that he would help you bear it you know that means it can be tolerable you just need a little bit of ointment a little bit of perspective a little bit of priorities being aligned right in your life I've told this story I'll tell it again I got a crazy fellow at work his name's Scott he runs those 250 mile long races through deserts and everything he comes back with broken feet and he finishes the race why because in perspective finishing is more important than his foot did you know that IBC is now on iTunes TuneIn SoundCloud and Google Play head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today and as always thanks for listening